Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul. I am one of the I'm so, the social studies instructor here at Penn Foster High School. Want to uh, welcome you all to our webinar today on the third lesson in American history from 1790s to the start of the Civil War. We're going to get into just the first objective within the course. Um, it is an involved one, so I wanted to make sure that we covered as much uh, it covered in, in as much detail as we could and then have a little bit more time in future webinars uh, on this lesson to be able to kind of get into more of the lessons. Um, so I want to thank you all for attending. Um, a couple of just kind of no, no, uh, uh, notes to kind of uh, taken. Um, you will receive an email with this recording tomorrow, so you won't have to worry about, you know, hearing everything, memorizing everything, um, taking notes or anything like that. You will get a recording of this, like I said, by email, just like the registration email that you received. Um, I want to just kind of cover some of the ways that it's best for students to be able to contact and be able to get in contact with myself and the rest of our educational team. Um, we are available by phone, uh, the 1-888-427-1000. Option 5 will get you in touch with uh, a member of the educational team. And if you have questions on any particular subject or uh, you know something going on in your account we'll, or on your uh, program courses page or grades page, we'll be more than happy to help you out. We are also available. Um, on our help and support page by sending an email and also to schedule an appointment um, on the help and support page. So by all means, take advantage of those as well as the live help and webinar schedules that you have right on your program courses page. There's the high school webinar webinar schedule that you can view and be able to see the ones that are coming up for American history, um, as well as the live help that I offer for American history and the other social studies courses. And then all of our other courses as well do provide quite a few resources. So definitely, de definitely take advantage of that. Sorry, I wasn't sharing my screen before. Um, I do apologize for that. So uh, just kind of moving along. Um, we also have texting available. If you text along 39033, um, you can text the word learn to that number and be able to get in contact with, again, a member of the educational team that you can ask any questions that you, as, as you're moving along in your program. So a lot of good ways to be able to contact us. We certainly want to hear from you. We want to know if you have questions or be able to help you as often as we can. So please take advantage of these resources and support. As I said, uh, the, the lesson today or the webinar today is going to be covering uh, section one of lesson three, which is really looking at the political tensions during the 1790s. You know, we talk about, we look at today's uh, politics between Republicans and Democrats, and um, not a lot changed in the last uh, 230 years, unfortunately, uh, that, that the 1790s had a lot of political strife as well. So we'll kind of get into that and kind of and talk more about that and, and hopefully um, you'll you'll walk away with from this webinar with a little bit more understanding. As I go along, if you do have questions, please use the questions uh, uh, box here on the webinar, and I'll be more than happy to answer those uh, towards the end. So it's an interest. So so sort of the the interesting part of early American political thought was surrounding the French and the French government. And from the beginning, when America uh, waged its war of independence, France was on our side. The French monarchy, the, that of uh, King Louis, wanted to not just support us, but more importantly, wanted to hurt Britain. So they were allies with us. And when France had its own revolution, its own um, revolt against the tyranny of a monarch, of the king. We also celebrated that. And really, it was a, sort of a, a bipartisan celebration that between the uh, Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, we see both political parties really celebrating the idea that um, there was a new constitutional monarch. There was a new um, government that was going to govern by the will of the people. That a new legislature was taking over. The king, uh, Louis XVI, was going to have far less power 
over over France had would have far less absolute power, and that the French government, this new French government, was really going to be not only a friend of America, but also a, a, a really significant ally, a significant ally in the ideas of the Enlightenment. Both the American Revolution and the French Revolution are really geared towards the Enlightenment that I talked about um, in a previous uh, previous webinar, which is available on. Um, within the webinar, the high school webinar uh, schedule, there are some of there are my recorded webinars as well, so you'll be able to view those. But the ideas of the Enlightenment over the uh, that talked about the will of the people, that the that unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, really came to fruition with these two revolutions. But as successful as the American Revolution was in meeting those enlightenment standards and even today we are you know we we still try to hold on to many of the same governing principles that that uh, the united states was established on france is not able to stay on the same path and we see what becomes known as the reign of terror that uh kills the king so the the idea of a constitutional monarchy go, goes away rather quickly and the new leadership of the revolution becomes far more extreme and far more extreme, particularly when it comes to um, the rights of the poor. And in doing so, they, it really leads to a large amount of violence, that the reign of terror is really a time in which not only some guilty folks were, were tried and, and, and executed like the king, but some who were just who are just questioning the leadership of this new of the new government of France. So we really see kind of a a, a loss of what it is that um, that the French Revolution was attempting to have. I'm getting a message that that uh, not able to see. Not, not certainly you're not going to see me. You are going to see my screen. So is everyone able to see my screen in terms of the PowerPoint presentation? Okay, so yes, you you want to be able to see the presentation. Um, my face isn't going to be shown, and um, I do have to have you all, unfortunately, uh, muted just to be able to view the presentation. But again, you can certainly type in questions. Um, and even after the webinar, if you want to email in through the help and support page or even email back in the go to webinar confirmation emails or when you get the recording of the email um, you'd certainly be able to answer or ask questions there but unfortunately um, I'm, I'm not able to um, have questions you know just kind of talk through um, that that uh, this right now so thank you thank you so much so thank you so far for for questions I, I really do appreciate that um, so really, so so as much as it, the French Revolution at the beginning was sort of a bipartisan celebration, the reign of terror becomes far more political, or uh, far more of a division between the political parties. The Federalists really see the reign of terror as just a loss of order; that it becomes far too extreme. That the 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 folks and, and the Federalists were were those who supported the Constitution. Uh, believed in a stronger form of government, and it was a party, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, that that wanted to see order, that really valued order. And because of what they saw in the reign of terror, they really start to push the, the U.S. government to be more supportive of Great Britain. That Great Britain, as a as as still a constitutional monarch, showed stability and showed its the 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 um, ability to be able to govern effectively with between a king and a representative government uh, in parliament. The Democratic Republicans saw saw the French Revolution and, and saw the reign of terror as just part of a world struggle that freedom was not going to be easy and thomas jefferson once famously said that the tree of liberty must be uh, must be fed by the blood of b blood of tyrants 
and blood of those of, of those who want to be free. So he, along with uh, his political party, the Democratic Republicans, really saw the reign of terror as something that was almost a good thing, that there needed to be this type of struggle between not just the uh, the people and the, and the monarchy, but also between the people and the elites. That it wasn't just about the elites having political power. And some of the Democratic Republicans really believe that the Federalists wanted only the, the elites to have power. But the Democratic Republicans argued that the, that, that the people, that, that uh, peasants, that middle class uh, workers, working class, they were not getting any type of freedoms in France. So they had to pursue a more extreme French Revolution. And we start really seeing sort of the, the, the really uh, division between the political parties over this issue of the French Revolution, that both sides saw each other, saw the other side as dangerous. And we almost see that, unfortunately, today in our political process, that Republicans see the Democrats, see Republican, I'm sorry, Republicans see Democrats as um, not caring about order, not caring about people's lives because of um, immigration. And Democrats view Republicans as heartless and, and uh, mean because they don't care about children at the border. Again, the extremes and, and really believing that the other side is dangerous. That, that is not the recipe. That is not the way that, that democracies and, and particularly political parties are able to function well. And this is sort of a, a, a long, long-standing dispute about political parties. And um, George Washington, in particular, warned of political parties as he's leaving office. And we'll kind of see how that kind of um, uh, how we see that as as he is president during this time. And so Washington has to make a decision. Where am I going to? How am I going to govern? That even though he doesn't believe in political parties, he doesn't like political parties, he does decide to run as, and, and be president as a federalist. So he really establishes uh, American politics as, um, as wanting, wanting to see order, that Washington as a military general uh, uh, believed in order and wanted order. So when there is war that, that, that eventually breaks out between France and England over the, the uh, French Revolution, and particularly when Napoleon Bonaparte becomes emperor of France after the reign of terror, Washington decides to establish neutrality, that he is forced because of his belief as a Federalist and, and some of the pressure of his Federalist party, he decides to break the alliance that helped him win the American Revolution, break the alliance with the French. He sort of argues at, uh, on economic terms that he believes that by by taking sides in in the war, he's really just kind of limiting opportunities for U for U.S. Econ for the U.S. economy. So he really takes it from an economic standpoint and and also as a military standpoint that he's not going to want to wage a war, or begin to help wage a war with a with a army of the United States that's not ready to fight as not going to be successful. So it's always so so Washington attempts to be pragmatic when he does this um, or when he when he makes these decisions about neutrality and about waging war. The French are obviously upset. Uh, the French are you know have seen the US kind of go back go back on their alliance step by step and now to the point of neutrality the u.s ultimately saying we're not getting involved in your war with great britain the french have had enough so they send an envoy an ambassador named edmund gannett and gannett is sent there initially to just try to gain more support by the u.s and when washington refuses to see him refuses to see gannett um, against the encouragement by his secretary of state thomas jefferson and that kind of goes goes uh, his own way, and and some wonder if Jefferson himself supported Gannett going this way. 
But Gannett goes to privateers, to, to essentially pirates, and asks them to attack British ships. If you remember back in the initial lesson, in the first lesson of American government or American history, we saw British essentially doing the same thing to Spain. That that because England was not very, was not a strong enough country to be able to fight Spain, Spain on its own, it hires privateers, it hires some of its own English citizens to simply be on their own going after going after Spanish ships, and Gannett decides to do the same thing. So he goes to these privateers, these pirates from America, and says, "Please go attack British ships," and in if you do that, I will allow you, the French government will allow you to do business in the French Caribbean islands. And other merchants or your allies will be able to do the same thing. So again, that's kind of going from the same economic standpoint that Washington had originally. Well, obviously, the British are not fans of these privateers. So they begin retaliating as being the most strong, the most powerful navy in the world they start seizing American ships and still having territory in in the United States or in, in North America, particularly in Canada, they decide to take advantage of their power and go back into the forts that were in the in the plains and in, in the Northwest that originally were given back up to the American uh, to the new American colony or the new American government, I should say. The British also go to their al their Native American allies and give them resources to be able to attack US settlers, American settlers, as they're moving west into Native American territory. So we really start seeing a, a split and, and, and really problems for the United States because they're not going to be able, they're not in position, as Washington already knew, they're not in position to fight either the French or the British. So now both the French and the British are mad at, at the US. So Washington has to make start making some deals, and he essentially ignores the French. He does not believe the French are are really the game that he wants to start getting into because he's not sure of how stable France is. Um, at the time, Napoleon Bonaparte is the emperor, and and Washington is not sure of how long Napoleon is going to stay in power. So he decides Washington decides to go to England to, and make a deal. So he sends John Jay, who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and tries to negotiate against the direct hostilities that Britain is having. So even though the French are having, um, are, are sort of doing their small skirmishes with the U.S. and kind of going after indirectly, because Great Britain is attacking it, attacking with actual guns and, and cannons, Washington does sort of have that priority. The treaty that, that Jay ultimately signs is controversial. It really moves America closer to Britain. It makes more of an alliance with Great Britain. And for many in the US, they really view it as a show of weakness by the United States, that the United States was willing to basically let Britain off with, with, uh, with you know, waging wars through the Native Americans, waging wars against our territory in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the the forts, we just kind of let that go. And we allow Great Britain to kind of keep their hold in North America, but we, we are willing to sign off on this alliance. And with Washington's support, even the Federalists were leery of this, of this agreement. So the Senate does approve the measure, but, very, but by a very small margin. The Federalists at this time are incredibly popular in the American people and have been winning elections the first you know, eight years of the elections. And yet they, their own party is not willing to completely um, be solidified behind Washington for this election. So once again, we see the two parties really solidifying. We're no longer at Washington at one point believed in, in the beginning of his term as office that political parties were just going to be temporary, that they were a way for uh, Americans to organize over the Constitution, 
organize over small issues and 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 uh, temporary issues. He did not believe that this was truly going to be a permanent part of American politics. Washington is clearly wrong about that. That that the political parties are again becoming becoming more solidified. Um, So this question that, that I'm just seeing, did Washington make an agreement? He made it. Um, so the J, uh, the, the, the J Treaty was Washington's agreement with Britain. So they essentially, again, they sort of take the, they become very willing and become more willing to allow Britain to hold on to territory in the Americas, so mainly in Canada. Um, but we want to hold on to the alliance with Great Britain. So we are willing to allow that as long as Britain is not attacking the United States and not, and not attacking through the, the forts that they're taking back over through the Native American treaties. So that's the agreement that, that George Washington is able to make through the Chief Justice John Jay. Now, that this, this kind of comes up with another question. Why on earth is the Chief Justice of the United States going and, and making these treaties? You know, we, we think of our Chief Justice today, John... Um, John Roberts, um, he has a full-time job. He is chief justice. He has business to, to attend to. At the beginning of the United States, the federal court system has very little power. And this is something that we'll actually talk uh, about a little bit in a little while. Um, but so that's why John Jay is, is sent. So he has he has he needs a, a more permanent job than just chief, than just chief justice. So another kind of big reason why the political parties become more solidified and more permanent is this idea of popular sovereignty. So from the beginning, the United States, as, as we know, is sort of a winner-take-all political party and, or, or government. If the winner is the winner, there's, no second, there, there's nothing you get for second place. So thinking back to our own elections, um, our, our last you know, ele few elections, um, Democrats won very uh, won a lot of close seats, close races uh, last year in the congressional elections. It and the, and the person who won gets to just make decisions about uh, his his or her votes in the Congress or in the Senate or in the governor's race um, or in governor in, in governor's mansions, I should say. The winner gets to make decisions. There's not a whole lot that the that the loser campaign really gets to do. Same thing at the, at the presidential level in 2016. Very close election between Pres, uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump won the electoral college. Hillary Clinton actually won more votes, but because of our system, Donald Trump is, is elected president. He's able to make decisions. It's no, it's not a a, a government that okay, well, Hillary gets to make these decisions. Donald gets to make these decisions. It's it's the winner. The winner gets to make the decisions. So because of how powerful votes are, these political parties had to organize in order to do that, in order to make to win elections. And even you know, just like today, most Americans were standing with one party or the or the other and voted one party or another. So Democrats. You know, thinking about today, Democrats voted for Democrats. Republicans vote for de Republicans. Back in the 1790s, Federalists voted for Federalists. Democratic Republicans vote for Democratic Republicans. And really, sort of the the epitome, the 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 cornerstone of showing how political parties were solidified and really ingrained in America was just how. Washington's legacy was different as he was leaving office when he was about to retire versus, you know, today. Back then, he was loved by Federalists, hated by Democratic Republicans. Democratic Republicans looked at policies over, you know, some of these foreign policy issues, some of his um, decisions on the um, economics of the United States um, that, that, uh, really favored stronger government favored some of the elites that came that that end up losing uh in the french revolution some of those same arguments were being made 
in the United States. That the Democratic Republicans looked at Washington's, Washington's decisions and saying, wow, this you know, rich farmer from Virginia is making decisions that are going to benefit hi him and his rich friends. And, and you know, we, we can say you know, some of the same things over the last you know, decades or so of, oh, well, the people, are, politicians are making decisions that are supporting um, those who like them, those who support them. So we sort of see, you know, the, the legacy of Washington and, and today, you know, no matter who, what political party you belong to, Washington is loved. Washington is a beloved figure in American politics and American history. Not not the case when he was actually alive and not, and not when he was certainly not when he was president of the United States. But Washington was still unifying, even though there were Americans who despise his his beliefs and despise what his politics were he was still a beloved figure and won two elect two two elections and the federalist party was was favored thanks to washington the next election that washington is not on the ticket is much different so the election of 1796 to to the, for the person who would succeed or or come after washington was a much more was was, was a much tougher election so Washington's vice president, John Adams, ran as, as the, the main Federalist for the party. Um, the, the party itself believed in strong, a strong federal government, a strong U.S. Constitution. And as I mentioned before, believed in sort of uh, an Alexander Hamilton economic uh, economy. So if, if you uh, know about the, the, about the musical, there's a lot talked about Hamilton and, and the revolution. Not as much fanfare is made of Hamilton, the economic, uh, the Treasury Secretary of the United States, who really created a government and created an economy based on the elites of New York and the elites of of major cities around the United States. He is sort of the centerpiece. Hamilton creates the centerpiece of it's more important that our cities are financially good, that our banks are financially good rather than necessarily the small farmers. And he, more than anything, uh, early in the United States history is, is a significant part of what American politics and what American economy looks like. On the other side was Thomas Jefferson. He resigned um, the Secretary of State position under Washington, predominantly over the French Revolution. Um, and he decides to run for president. So he, uh, runs as a democratic republican he is the sort of one of the founders of the party and he decides to run um run for president as a party themselves they are predominantly funded by wealthy southern politicians however the votes they get are from ordinary citizens and and immigrant populations and their main viewpoint is independence, equal rights, free elections. That's sort of their mantra, while the Federalists were the friends of order. So both of these parties came came into power over the French Revolution. And we sort of see their, their tendencies based on the, the, the ideas of the French Revolution. The Federalists were, were astonished and disgusted by how the, how the French governed because of the disorder that happened because of the reign of terror. Democratic Republicans wanted more revolution, wanted to see more um, rights for the lower classes and, and were willing to have violence because of that. And so their uh, quotes, independence, equal rights, free elections, that's sort of where they're coming from. The election results are, are end up being a very close election. That New England, the, the northern part, the more urban parts of the United States supported Adams. The South voted for Thomas Jefferson. The middle of the country ends up deciding the election, and predominantly they do decide for John Adams. Now, it's a sort of a split decision between John Adams becoming president and then second place Thomas Jefferson becoming vice president. In the pre previous two elections, George Washington was elected president, but then the Federalists were able to organize themselves well enough to not only have the first place winner, but also the second place winner, which was John Adams. Both of them Federalists 
Washington is elected president. John Adams is elected vice president. Because of the split between the Federalists, Adams becomes president, but the number two Federalist, Thomas Pickney, it win, it goes for third. So because of sort of a split between the Federalists, and it happens that president that that John Adams is sort of the more moderate wing of the Federalist Party. He is less he, he he's less interested in citing a lot of anger. I apologize for, for going a little too fast. I apologize for that. I'll stop for questions in a minute. Um, but um, you know, a Adams Adams wants to make consensus. He is actually, you know, he and Thomas Jefferson were friends for years um, through the beginning of the Declaration of Independence all the way until um, the Adams presidency. They are they are very good friends. And so Adams does not have a lot of ill will towards Jefferson. Alexander Hamilton, on the other hand, hates Thomas Jefferson, hates Republican or hates the Democratic Republican Party, hates their supporters. So he and and many other many others view Adams as as almost part of their enemies, as one of their enemies. So he so Hamilton really tries to gain more support for Pickney to win the presidency, but. But he's unsuccessful. So Adams is able to kind of win over enough support, not only in New England, but also in the mid-Atlantic. So Pennsylvania, um, Maryland, Virginia. He's able to win enough of their support as well to win over the presidency. But Pickney is not able, you know, because Pickney is sort of a little too extreme, Jefferson is able to kind of win the win, win the vice presidency. Um, which is another kind of interesting part of early American politics that the winner of the presidential election win, is president, the second place is vice president, which sounds which sounds reasonable if you think about it in terms of just pure winners should should have you know winners should govern. But if we think about it in terms of now now with political parties, it becomes a little problematic. You know, think about if if uh, Donald Trump is president and Hillary Clinton is, is his vice president, how well would that work out? If uh, Barack Obama was president and John McCain was his vice president back in 2009, again, probably would not have worked very well. So we see a lot, you know, th again, this was sort of an idea. Oops, I'm sorry. This was an idea that was a good one when the Constitution was first written, but that was before before uh, political parties. And as soon as now you see political parties and sort of the 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 um, the popular sovereignty and the organizing of the voters behind particular candidates behind different platforms, we we immediately see that problems start arising. So I will I will stop for a moment. Are there any questions, any additional questions before we keep going? Okay. No, nope, question just came up. Um, and again, if you if you um, don't get everything, you can certainly um, view the recording when it comes when it's emailed to you uh, uh, tomorrow. But um, we will continue on. So uh, Ham, uh, John Adams' time in office is really. Um, be, begins to be important mainly again on the international stage. And again, it's still France um, having uh, having additional anger.
and so the French do end their their cooperation with the with the um, with the United States, and they take another step towards uh, deciding to seize more U.S. trade ships. So again, we we sort of see a, a large European power decide to take uh, American ships once again, and so Adams decides to send his uh, additional ambassadors to France to try and negotiate a, a settlement, a peaceful settlement for the U.S. to be able to continue uh, trade between different European powers, mainly the British and the French. So he sends um, diplomats, and they are basically told by three uh, French agents of the of the of uh, the foreign ministry of France that in order to be seen to be able to negotiate, they need to provide loans to the French government, and also those three free, uh, French agents require bribes. They require direct payment from from the diplomats of the U.S. Um, to be even seen by the French ambassadors. Well, this is seen as not only dishonoring of the three ambassadors of the of the diplomats, but also dishonoring the United States. And when the when John Adams and America finds out about this, there, there's anger overall. And uh, Federalist newspapers around the country start calling it what uh, the XYZ affair, that these French agents X, Y, and Z are dishonoring the U.S., are embarrassing the U.S. with, with these negotiations. So America begins to really turn against the French. And the popularity of Adams and the Federalist Party to really deal with the French um, Go, you know, go sky high. So Adams really has sort of a free hand to begin what's called a quasi quasi war with the French and and continue and increase the support to the British. That because now the U.S. is being um, again dishonored, get discredited by the French, now we're willing to be far more close with the British. And this unfortunately kind of turns uh, domestically as well. That when you go into war, and this has been, you know, this has gone on a number of times in U.S. history, America goes to war against a foreign power, and we end up as an American government really um, kind of overplaying it domestically within the United States. And in the case of this quasi war, this X Y Z affair with France. It's when John Adams and the Federalists sign the uh, two acts known as the Alien Sedition Acts. They're passed in 1798. The Alien Act is, gives um, Adams and the federal government broad power to deport foreigners um, with the idea that foreigners are going to try to attack the American system, that they are going to be they are the ones who are um, uh, try to sow dissent within the United States, try to cause people to want to go to war. And more importantly, they did not allow immigrants who are still in the United States, allow them to vote for a number of years. Usually it was it was just a matter of, of months that, he, that a, a, an immigrant had to be in the United States in order to vote. The uh, Alien Act spreads that out to multiple years. Now, if many federal, the, the um, re Democratic Republican newspapers began kind of criticizing these types of acts, thinking, you know what, you're not, you're, this is not just about the French. This is not just about um, this quasi war. You're actually now attacking political opponents. That because the, the many immigrants are supporters of the Democratic Republicans, you're attacking your opposition, your political opposition, rather than an enemy that is actually trying to uh, do that. Um, so uh, some, someone's asking about sort of similarities between that kind of act and what's going on today with, with uh, sort of a um, uh, the the president in particular attacking immigrant populations, you know, it, it, it is, you know, the, you, you could certainly see similarities. And again, this has happened in, in multiple years, um, multiple times, um, even 
during World War II, there was a relocation of Japanese Americans um, during World War II. There were uh, dis discrimination against um, Russians and, and uh, uh, other immigrants, Eastern European immigrants during the Cold War. There were um, discrimination against uh, German and Italians uh, during World War I as well. So we see a lot of um, policies that, uh, and attempted policies to, re to kind of push um, against those who are um, dissimilar, those who may be seen as others. You know, we see that, unfortunately, throughout American history. Um, and, you know, as, as often as it does happen, it always swings back. You know, we, we never go too far in, in, in one direction or another uh, without some type of correction being done. Um, So yes, part part of the part of the law itself limited the the time or, or extended the time that until someone could vote. So again, there was there was a shorter limit before the Alien Act, and now it's become a longer act or or a longer time frame, um, in, in if, for an immigrant to be able to start voting after they become a U.S. citizen. So that's that's another part of of uh, of. Uh, the process as well that 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 immigrants have to be natural have to become citizens in order to vote. Another act that was passed is called was called the Sedition Act, and it prohibited public opposition to the government. So according to Adams and according to Federalists, um, this again was sort of a way that people who were supporting the French were going to try to sow dissent within the United States, was going to try to persuade people to not believe in the United States or try to push the Amer uh, America into war with the French or the British. Um, it was, again, criticized for going against Republican Democrats, uh, de Democratic Republicans, I'm sorry, um, that, that the part that the act itself was far more about attacking opposition rather than protecting the United States or protecting the um, the, the uh, government. Now, um, and, and to begin with, 20 Republican news editors were arrested during this uh, within the Sedition Act. No one was uh, actually um, prosecuted with the Sedition Act, um, but certainly it did still kind of fears among um, uh, Democratic Republicans to say, you know, you're, you're just trying to stop opposition. You're trying to s keep us from talking and having conversations, having opposition within a Democratic Party or within a Democratic system. Now, in many of the cases that acts like these were um, were created, there was always a fail safe of our court system that even when Abraham Lincoln um, ended habeas corpus, which was uh, basically a um, the ability for some for the rights of the accused, he tried to end those during the Civil War. As I mentioned, Franklin Roosevelt uh, relocated Japanese Americans. Um, and on and on, we sort of we, we see these uh, instances of limited rights during wartime. But we always had a court system to protect us. That eventually the court system would uh, bring about an end to some of these laws. Back at the time of the Alien Sedition Acts, our federal court systems were not an equal form of, were not an equal branch. That the, that even the Supreme Court did not. Um, did not have any real power until after uh, the, the Alien Sedition Acts, and actually even after John Adams is president. Um, something called judicial review comes into play um, in, in uh, uh, I believe, 1804 was, was, the, um, was the Supreme Court case called John, uh, Marbury versus Madison, where the Supreme Court um, begins uh, to, to take their own power and say, you know what, the Supreme Court, in its interpretation of the Constitution, has to be able to call a law either constitutional or not. And that is where the federal government really gains its power, or the, the uh, judiciary branch gains its power. But it's not here yet. The, the branch is actually very weak um, at the beginning of the United States. But it, it, the power really comes to the states. 
And so Republican governments around the country, uh, the political parties around the country, organize to go against the Sedition Act in particular. So um, the states of Virginia and Kentucky are organized by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison to pass resolutions that, be, that essentially nullify the Sedition and Alien Acts. That they essentially say in these resolutions, we will not enforce these un, unjust laws in our states. And so this becomes sort of the big political question of the 1790s. Who has ultimate authority? Who has more power, the federal government or the state government? And this is a question that really comes to um, be pushed for, for years to come all the way up to the Civil War. That comes to the end of my presentation. Um, are, there, are there any additional questions? I really appreciate the questions thus far. Are there any others? Well, I want to thank you all for your attendance today. Um, feel free, if you, if you do have questions, you can type them in. Um, but I will go ahead and end the uh, presentation today. Um, again, thank you, uh, thank you very much. You will get, uh, like I said, you will get this recording tomorrow afternoon. So kind of watch out for that. But um, again, thank you all. Have a good day and uh, and good luck in your studies.